chunks of my variables, with my variables which live on the n-dimensional hypersphere of radius square root of n. Okay, and then I will bias this uniform distribution on the hypersphere with uh, what you would expect for a spin glass, so a sum of i and j, you know, xi, wij, xj. So, this is a relaxation of the uh, sherrington kirkpatrick model. So in the sherrington kirkpatrick model, we don't have this. We have this, where the xi are plus or minus one, the wij are actually uh, drawn from the same distribution. And you see that if all your xi are plus or minus 1, then of course the sum of the xi square, of sum of the i xi square, is n. Right? So the original binary spin configuration are on the hypersphere of the same radius. But there are plenty of configurations on the hypersphere which do not correspond to binary spins, right? So this problem is much simpler. It's a huge relaxation. So it helps a lot. Essentially, it can be solved very easily, as you will see. OK, so is it clear for the model? So I'm interested in this model. And actually, I will first simplify it. I will consider a simpler version of it. I mean, actually, I will consider a different model, which is a simplification. So this is the spherical spin glass model. So I will consider a multivariate distribution. And I will use a different notation, so it will be a row of x1, x2, xn, which is given by the same measure, except that there is a big change here. Mu identity minus w, ij, xj. So mu is a parameter. I'm going to explain you how it's chosen in a, in a couple of seconds. So you see. Um, oh, sorry, yes, that's, that was a bad measure. It's much better now, thank you. Okay, so the, what is the difference between this and that? Here, this constraint is a half constraint. I'm really on the hypersphere. I cannot move out from the hypersphere. Here, I don't have any such half constraint, but I have a soft constraint on the sum on the sum of i x i squared, which is a function of mu. By tuning my, my parameter mu, I can actually make this increase or decrease, right? So if I have very high mu positive, it will shrink everything, and this will be very small, right? If I have very low mu, then it will be much larger. And I have to be careful that it shouldn't be too low, because otherwise it's not even a positive definite matrix, right? And we run into troubles here. So I will choose mu. such that this soft constraint is satisfied. So I'm replacing a hard constraint by a constraint which is true only on average. It's not the same model, right? This one is a hard constraint. This one is just a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Yes? So is there a minus missing in the left? Here? Mm -hmm. No, here it's a plus. So you see it's a. And you see here you have a plus also. Here you, you have this, uh, right? If you are minimizing this uh, X, W, X term? No, no, I'm maximizing. I will be interested in, in finding the, the, the configuration variables with the highest probability. So I would like to maximize this, for instance, on the sphere. OK? okay? So you see, it's a, this one is much simpler model. It's just a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And you know that the covariance matrix of this is simply the inverse. So Cij, so obviously the average values of the xi are equal to 0. It's just the average of xi, xj. This is simply given by mu identity minus w to the minus 1 i. So how do I know that mu is actually well-defined? There is a single uh, unique mu which actually uh, corresponds to this constraint. Well, that's easy to see. And the, maybe the simplest way to do that is to go to the eigenbasis of W, which is obviously an eigenbasis of C. 
So we go to the eigenbasis. So we write W E A equal to lambda A E A. Uh, and then I will order my eigenvalues from the top one to the smallest one. Lambda one will be larger than lambda two, which will, uh, to the last one, which is the smallest one, which is lambda n. And all these vectors here are normalized vector, unit norms. Okay? Sorry. Yes? Yes. Yes. But then this is just a way of solving this problem? Yes, sorry, ah. sorry, I was not clear on that. So I am interested in that, but okay. since I'm quite slow, I first solve the easier problem, and then I will go back to this one, right? And this one is very easy because you know everything about Gaussian distribution. So we know immediately what is going on, and then we'll see what's the difference between we move back to the hard constraint. OK, so, um, so now I can compute the soft constraint here with that. So we know if we go to the uh, eigenbasis, so I compute xA, which is just a projection of x dot ea, then of course we know that the statistic is such that the average value of xA tilde is going to be zero. That's the same as the average value of xi. And the uh, second moment is going to be diagonal. And, the di and it's simply one over mu minus lambda a. At, at, uh, okay, the denominator is simply mu minus lambda, right? That you can read immediately from this formula here. Okay, so how do I know now that mu is uniquely defined? Well, if I look at my soft constraints here, no, maybe I should go to the other right one. Can I, can I erase here? OK, so my soft constraint is sum over i xi squared on average is equal to n. But that is equivalent to sum over a if I go to the eigenbasis x till a squared equal n. That's the same thing, which is the same thing as using the, the formula on the right here. Sum over a of uh, 1 over mu minus lambda i. And that should be equal to n. OK? So now, let me define the function f of mu, which is simply 1 over n, sum over a, 1 over mu minus lambda a. And I plot this here on this axis as a function of mu. So you see, I want to find when for, for which mu f is equal to 1. And this function here is as actually a simple behavior, right? It has poles for all the eigenvalues. So the, the biggest one, by definition, is lambda 1. Then I'm assuming that they are not uh, they are degenerate. You know, it's not a big assumption, actually. You get, if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, then you move to lambda 3. It's the same thing. Lambda 2 is here. No, let me make this a bit bigger. Lambda 3 is here, and so on, up to lambda n. So what is my function doing? When you see it's actually doing, so it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in between two eigenvalues. It does something like that, right? And then if I am above lambda 1, it starts from plus infinity, and then it goes down to 0. OK? So you see that there is a unique value of mu, which is this one, such that the constraint is satisfied, and all the mu minus lambda a are positive for all a's which makes, obvious, obviously, uh, this unique solution the good one. This solution the good one because they should, all the variances should be positive, right? So there is a unique solution, which will depend on the spectrum of my W matrix. OK, so this model is well defined. And now I would like to investigate it. So in the last uh, yeah, 20 something minutes, what is going on in the large n limit? In fact, just to be a little bit more precise, when you have a multivariate Gaussian distribution, there is not so much that you can ask 
And the only thing you can ask is what is the extension of a cloud of points when you draw randomly some samples along the different eigen, eigen vectors, right? So if I plot, so for instance, assume that here I do it again in, in two dimensions, but it's an n-dimensional problem. So this is x1, x2. Now if I do, if I go to the eigenbasis E1, E2, and I should do that along all the uh, n-dimensional, uh, I mean, space, then if I draw my points randomly, I will have points which are close to the origin. And the density of points will be weaker and weaker when, if I go far away from the origin. And that defines some cloud of points here. This contour line could be correspond to one standard deviation, for instance. Right? So now the question, sorry, that should be a really an ellipse, which is, uh, OK. So now the question is, what happens when, the, the question I'm interested in is, what happens when n goes to infinity? Right? So you see, there are two things you can find when n goes to infinity. It could be that if I look at the typical extension along this axis here, they remain finite. They are for finite n. They are given by this formula. One over square root of mu minus lambda a. So this is the extension here. It's one over square root of mu minus lambda one. The extension here is one over square root of mu minus lambda two. OK? Or it could be that actually along some direction, since n goes to infinity, something strange happens. And maybe one direction becomes much wi wider than the other ones. Right? So do they remain all finite, or some of them become infinite when n goes to infinity? This is my question. And the answer is it depends on sigma, which is the width, obviously, of w. And you will see that a phase transition takes place at a critical value of sigma. And this is what I would like to show here. Can I get rid of that? Yeah. And then we, once we understand that, we have to, we will understand the typical configuration of the multivariate Gaussian distribution, and then we'll have to project back on the hypersphere to, to find back the hard constraint, right? OK, so okay, so just a few facts about random matrices that you know, because you told me that you know about these random uh, matrices. So uh, if I look at the, um, at the density of eigenvalues for lambda, that converges when n goes to infinity. And this is a normal sure convergence. I will come back to the large deviation tomorrow, because that, that's interesting. But so far, I'm not interested in that. To Wigner, uh, Wigner semicircle distribution. Which is really a semicircle here. That's the density of eigenvalues as a function of lambda, uh, which is comprised between plus 2 sigma and minus 2 sigma. And it's given exactly by, I don't want to make mistake, in front, 2, 2 pi sigma squared, square root of 4 sigma squared, minus lambda squared. This is what you obtain with priority 1 when n goes to infinity. I, I guess you know about that, right? Semicircle. OK, that's good, because then we can use this formula and to, and to compute the value of mu because mu is given by that this constraint. So when n goes to infinity, mu is the root of 1 equal to f of mu, which when n goes to infinity is simply the integral of a lambda between minus 2 sigma and 2 sigma of rho of lambda over mu ma minus lambda. Okay, it's just a large n limit of my formula of the expression for f of mu, which was here. So you know rho of lambda, then it's just a matter of computing this integral, which is a simple integral. That can be done exactly. So I just give you the results. It's mu minus square root of mu squared minus 4 sigma squared over 2 sigma squared. 
obviously, this formula makes sense only if mu is larger than 2 sigma. We have to be on this side, right? Mu should be larger than lambda 1. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. But that's uh, the condition of a mu. Maybe I should, I should uh, write it here. OK, very good. So we can solve this equation. So let's, let me solve this equation. So I will just multiply by 2 sigma squared here and uh, put the square root on the left side. So I get, so this is equivalent to square root of mu squared minus 4 sigma squared equal to mu minus 2 sigma squared. OK? So we, and this is equivalent if mu is larger than 2 sigma squared. I can take the square, so I get mu squared minus 4 sigma squared is equal to uh, mu squared minus 4 sigma squared mu plus uh, 4 sigma to the 4. Okay, and then that gives mu equal to uh, 1 plus um, sigma squared, if I remember correctly. I mean, we just had to, to divide, but yeah, 1 plus sigma squared if you, you just simplify. Okay, so we can plot. So we have found the value of mu, which should be somewhere here. And we have found that this is mu equal to 1 plus sigma squared. So let's see whether I mean, our calculation makes sense or not. Suppose sigma is very small. Okay, so we have something which is very uh, narrow here. And mu is very close to 1. So, it's, so here it stops in something very small, and mu is 1. So it's very far away, very far to the right. So we are happy. All, uh, all, everything is correct. All our variances are nice, and so on. Now I am increasing sigma. And you see that something bad happens when sigma reaches 1. Because when sigma reaches 1, 2 sigma is equal to 1 plus 1 squared. So that mu is going to be exactly at this level here. This is the case sigma equal 1. And this is. Even worse if I go to sigma larger than 1, because when, larger sig when sigma is larger than 1, this condition is violated. The, the only solution I found from this equation was under this assumption, which is clearly wrong. Because 1 plus sigma squared is smaller than 2 sigma squared. So it doesn't make sense. I mean, this, this thing is becoming negative, right? So that means there is no solution to my equation. So what, is, so why, why, what is wrong here? So what is wrong is that, actually, I assume that I could replace the sum in f of mu with an integral. That's something people do in physics is well known. You get exactly the same thing in, in Bose-Einstein condensation, for instance. And so what happens is that in the, uh, if I look at my sum here, in fact, let me decompose it. So it's a sum from 1 to n. Let me decompose it in terms of 1 plus mu minus lambda 1 plus the sum for a larger than 2. It happens that when sigma is actually larger or equal to 1, mu gets stuck at the right edge of the spectrum. And it cannot move. It doesn't move away. It gets stuck here, which means that in my sum, not all terms can be actually replaced. The sum cannot be replaced exactly by the integral. I'm making a big mistake here. In particular, what is going on is that if I look at this, at this term here, I'm expecting that mu is very close to lambda 1, so it cannot be exactly equal. But it should be very close in such a way that actually it will contribute extensively to the sum. Right? It will matter. I cannot get rid of this term. It matters, maybe not as much as all these terms, but the same order of magnitude, right? So I'm expecting that mu minus lambda 1 will be of the order of 1 over n for sigma larger than 1. And this sum here will contribute a lot. Then, of course, you can say, OK, but what about the other one? Why should I single out this one and not the, the second one, lambda 2, right? I mean, I'm expecting that lambda 2 is actually pretty close to lambda 1. Lambda 1 is here. Lambda 2 is actually very close, especially when n is large, right? So it's a good point. And actually, we can understand what is going on for lambda 2. Sorry? Sorry? 
No, for sigma smaller than one, it's nice. I am in a situation where mu is one plus sigma squared, and it's very far away from the edge, which is two sigma. And when sigma is equal one, they touch. And then they don't unbind when sigma is larger than one. Okay? You see, when sigma is very small, this is very close to zero, and this thing here is very close to one, so they are very far away. And then you increase sigma. This one moves away, okay? But this one, when sigma is small, is going faster than this one. And then it, it keeps, and then it, it will touch it when sigma is equal to one. Maybe I should make a drawing here. As a function of sigma, I should plot lambda one, which is two sigma. And I should plot one plus sigma squared, which is doing something like that. And it's touching here. This is mu. So you see in the small sigma region, they are very far away from each other. And then they touch here, and they, they get equal when, when sigma equal 1. Is it OK? For sigma larger than 1, we, we, we also have 1 plus sigma squared larger than 1. No, no, no. Because this, I, I derive this solution under this assumption. You know, because I need this term to be positive, as this is a square root. But when sigma is larger than 1, you can check that 1 plus sigma squared is obviously smaller than 2 sigma squared. So it's negative. It doesn't make any sense. This, this is not a good solution for us. And there is no solution. So the only possibility is that it, it remains really uh, stuck to the boundary. There was another question? No? I was just wondering. Oh, yes. The new greater than 2 sigma squared condition. Um, we also want new greater than 2 sigma, right? Sorry? We also want new greater than 2 sigma. You want new to be larger than 2 sigma, yes. Also but it's, it's true for, you can check that 1 plus sigma squared is larger than 2 sigma for sigma smaller yeah. than 1. So yeah. everything is OK. Yes, absolutely. OK, so now you can say, OK, but what? So clearly, it means, if I'm correct here, that my picture when sigma is smaller than 1 is the correct one. That's this one. But when sigma is larger than 1, that's not correct anymore. Because, I mean, it's correct, but we have to be careful that this thing here will be of the order square root of n. You see, mu minus lambda 1 is 1 over n, so it's square root of n. Which means that, actually, if I look at my cloud, it will be something which is completely elongated along E1 here. So it will be something like that, E1, E2. So and this thing here will be of the order square root of n. I can be more precise about the elongation in just uh, the last 10 minutes, OK? So now the question is, what happens in this direction? Are they all safe? Are they all of the order 1? Or can some of them be actually pretty large or so, right? And the only thing we should do in order to do that is look at lambda 2 because this is the worst candidate, right? Or that's the best candidate to be large, right? But it's the worst case if you want. OK, so let's look at lambda 2. So now I'm making a hand-waving argument. This is the edge of my spectrum, right? Which stops here in 2 sigma. And there is a square root uh, singularity that you see here. So now the question is, if I drawing, so if I draw one, uh, if I draw n, um, uh, uh, n by n matrix, I look at the top eigenvalue. On average, it will be here, but actually there will be fluctuations, right? There will be fluctuation of a top eigenvalue, which is described by the uh, the Tracy Whedon distribution. And what matters here for us is that the fluctuations are of the order n to the minus two third. So that means we have to be very careful. We shouldn't say that you know, the precise value of lambda 1 for the specific sample I'm looking at can actually fluctuate by more than the difference with mu. So this is really mu minus lambda 1, which is of the order 1 over n. It's not mu minus 2 sigma. It's really the, the, the gap with the top eigenvalue of a specific sample. OK, so we expect this. So now, so this is lambda 1. Where is lambda 2? So if we had a flat distribution, you would know how much is the gap between the top, the edge of a, suppose you have n number, random numbers between 0 and 1, right? You know that the top one will be away from 1 by a quantity of the other 1 over n, capital N, right? OK? So here, you can do exactly the same argument, which is some kind of order statistic argument. You can say that the integral of this should be equal to 1 over n. And that will locate the average position of lambda 2. So I can compute from 2 sigma 
or let's say from 0 to lambda 2, square root of epsilon d epsilon, and said that it should be equal to 1 over n, and that gives you, that gives the, uh, so epsilon is this thing here, right? That gives me the uh, order of magnitude of lambda 2 as a function of n. So that gives me that epsilon to the 3 half lambda is equal to 1 over n, so lambda 2 is actually given by n to minus. So, sorry, it's, that's a gap, right? I'm sorry, I'm going too fast here. So I'm integrating the square root over a distance which is lambda 1 minus lambda 2. And I'm saying that the integral of this probability should be equal to 1 over n, okay? And that gives me that lambda 1 minus lambda 2 to the 3 half should be of the order 1 over s. So lambda 2 should be, uh, lambda 1 minus lambda 2 should be of the order n to minus 3 third, 2 third, which is the same order of magnitude as this fluctuation. Okay, but that's good because if I look at this for lambda 2, then I can write this as minus lambda 1 plus lambda 1 minus lambda 2, and it will be the fluctuations along lambda 2. So this is order 1 over n, and this is order 1 over n to the 2 third. So you see that it's much, much smaller than this one, right? So it means that the fluctuation will be big. If I look at the second direction, E2, there will be n to the 1 third, right? But very small compared to square root of n. And now if I look at how much they matter for this summation here, then actually they don't matter, right? Because that has to be divided by 1 over n in order to define f of mu. So f of mu, again, is given by the summation of this term here divided by n. So it's 1 over n divided by 1 over n, so it's order 1 here. And this thing will be 1 over n divided by something n to the 2 third. So it's 1 over n to the 1 third, which vanishes. So that means the following thing. That means there will be some direction along which actually my cloud will be large, but they don't matter to determine mu. OK? I don't care about them. Just, just a few of them, they don't matter. But along one of them, actually, it's, it's really big. Okay, so I'm almost done for the phase transition. Okay, so we, we, understood every, we understand everything about this distribution. So how do we go to the hard constraint? And, and we, have, we have finished. So, so far I have used this soft constraint. And the question is how much it's actually distorting our uh, spherical spin glass model. So I want to argue that actually for sigma smaller than one, it doesn't matter. While for sigma larger than one, it has a big influence. There is a big change. Okay, so, so we want to go, to go back to the hard constraint. Okay, so let's look at the, the constraint. This constraint is sum of a x a squared is equal to n. That's, we'd like this to be equal to n. Now, I um, would like to estimate this in my soft constraint setup with the multivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay, so if all, so I can use the central limit theorem which is a big hammer, maybe, uh, but I mean, that's fine for me. Um, we can use that when sigma is smaller than one. Why? Because these numbers here, they are just random numbers. They are the square projection here, right? They have a well-defined mean, which is this thing. And they have also a well-defined variance. Sorry, till everywhere. And the, all these variances are actually bounded by something which does not depend on n when n is large. They are order one, right? You can compute this, right? It's just a Gaussian thing, right? It's going to be, uh, be essentially uh, two times the square of a variance, right? So it's very easy to do. So it's bounded. And this, that's the only thing I need. So using central limi limit theorem, you know that this thing here is going to be equal to the mean plus some fluctuations, which will be of the order of the square root. You know, you have to compute the variance. It will be fluctuation of, of the order of a standard deviation, right? 
So plus fluctuations. And if I want to be more clear about that, this fluctuation I expect it to be of the order of square root of n. Well, this thing here is going to be exactly equal n because this is how we impose the value of mu with our soft constraint. So this is exactly equal to n. So that means by imposing only the soft constraints, I am actually pretty close to the hard constraint by very negligible terms. Is it always true what I, I just said? It's true in the regime where sigma is smaller than 1, because otherwise that is not true anymore. We, we have one thing here which is actually not bounded along the direction a equal 1, because this is of the order of n, and the variance will be also huge with n. So for, this is true for sigma smaller than 1. So for sigma smaller than 1, imposing the hard of a soft constraint is the same thing, essentially. OK? Now, what about sigma larger than 1? So for sigma larger than 1, it's interesting because I tell you, I can keep exactly the same reasoning, but only for the terms which are larger for a equal 2 or 3 and so on, uh, to n, right? Because they also have variances. When the few of them, they are big, but we know they don't matter in the total sum, right? They won't contribute much to, the order, to an extensive order of n. So I'm a bit sloppy here, but essentially what happens is that the sum of A running from 2 to um, n of x squared is going also to obey the central limit theorem. So it will be equal to um, n times the integral lambda rho of lambda 2 sigma minus lambda, because that's the value of mu when it's stuck to the edge between minus 2 sigma and 2 sigma, uh, with, ver with small deviation. So this, actually, this integral you can compute exactly. I gave you the formula with the square root of mu squared. I mean, you have everything. This is simply 1 over sigma. OK, so now I'm back to the hard constraint. The hard constraint is this plus this. So I know what x1 tilde square is. And now is a big change. So, and I will finish with that. So in the soft constraint case, with the soft constraint, if I look at the marginal distribution of x1 tilde, this is obviously a Gaussian distribution. So it will have a zero mean and some variance. Okay? And now what I'm saying is that if we go to the hard case, then we get a completely different distribution. Well, you know, from that, actually, x1 tilde can be computed exactly. And if I look at x1 till, so sorry, that was x1 till here, I get x1 till over square root of n, which is totally peaked either here in square root of 1 minus 1 over sigma, or here in minus square root of 1 minus. I get these two direct distributions, which obviously will have a finite width when n is, is finite, but I don't get any maximum of the distribution in 0. So why is it so? And I will finish. OK. It's so because we have computed it. But also, I mean, it's clear what is going on here when you reach. So when you increase sigma and you reach sigma by values which are smaller than 1 and you reach 1, this thing here becomes really wide, right? It's a very wide Gaussian distribution. In fact, if you look at it, it's minus x1 t squared over 2, 1 over mu. Sorry, uh, it's uh, mu minus lambda 1, OK? This thing is order 1 over n, so that means it's something of the order when you reach sigma equal 1. So it's extremely flat with very wide fluctuation of the order of n. Right? So that means actually I can move away the. G so if I want to reach the hard constraint from my soft constraint, I could do that in two ways, right? One is to say, okay, I put all the hard constraint, I just put it onto x1 field. And this is what I've done. And that determines this distribution here. And I'm claiming it's actually not serious. It's not bad to do that, because this distribution is so flat that you are not losing much in terms of probability by pushing x1 field to the, to the edges here of the order square root of n. It's actually very flat. 
The other way you could do it is to say, no, 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 I want to keep to my distribution, x1 tilde is something, right? And then I want to push my variables here. Central limit theorem tells me what is going on with high probability, but I can still push the variables, the summation here, to other values, right? But that would cost much more in terms of probability. It would be exponentially small in n in terms of probability. So it's very bad to do that, right? So this is why, actually, you get this distribution here, which is very different. OK, so let me conclude. So we have solved the model, and we have found that there is a phase transition in this model in the large n limit as a function of sigma, which plays the role as one over temperature. And we have another parameter, which is simply x dot the top eigenvector of w over square root of n, which is 0 up to sigma equal 1. And then it goes up as square root of 1 minus 1 minus sigma. So the interesting thing here is that the other parameter is exactly the kind of other parameter I was mentioning in my introduction. You know from the physics, the model is so simple, you know what is going to happen in the, at, at very large sigma. You are going to align your configuration along E1, the top eigenvector. And the question is just to measure the similarity between x and E1. And you get this phase transition. You know? So the model is so simple that actually we can use the old version of the other parameter. But then we'll see tomorrow how we can re recover everything with the replica approach. You will find back all these things here in a different way of thinking, but in a way which is much more powerful because when we don't have such a simple model, we don't know what we should compare x to, then we are stuck, right? So I think I should stop here. It's 12.30.